Hi, everybody. Welcome along to episode 103 of Percussion Discussion. As usual, I'm going to ask you to please check out our social media. You can find us on Facebook and Instagram. And of course, don't forget to subscribe to our world famous YouTube channel. Uh, here you will find all of our conversations past and present. Um, if you subscribe, it means you won't miss any of the great content that we have coming up for you. If you prefer to listen on the go, then this is no problem. Um, you can find all of our conversations available in podcast form. And these are free to download from all of your favorite podcast providers. If you can find a few seconds to leave us a review, uh, it'd be very much appreciated. It gets, helps get the word out there. Uh, On to today's drummer, one of the greatest uh, alternative music drummers, if you like, um, from punk to the, the post-punk uh, scene. Um, an amazing British drummer has played for the Slits. He's played for Susie and the Banshees. He's um, He was one of the founding members of The Creatures, big in Japan. He's played for some amazing, amazing uh, bands and artists. Um, a guy with a truly unique sound, a unique footprint, if you like, uh, pretty much instantly recognisable. Uh, and a guy who doesn't do too many interviews about his career. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome the fabulous Budgie. Budgie, thank you so much for doing this. It's great to see you. I'm trying to keep a serious face on now. God, it's very oh, nice to be here, Matty. Uh, I'm I'm really pleased to be linked to North Wales uh, from here in Berlin because it kind of puts me ah just over the water from where I was born. Yes, it does. Yeah, I'm almost almost looking at it. So how's how is it in Berlin? Is it? I think you said it was snowing a little bit, so it's it couldn't be further from here, really. We, we we had a late summer went on, and uh, we thought, whoa. It's never going to end. It got really hot again. And, uh, you know, it doesn't take much for Berliners to start walking around in shorts, which is not pretty, but never mind. But um, no, then suddenly snap. And uh, as soon as it does, it's it's just like the humidity here is really high and temperatures fall to minus four. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. yeah, so minus four with 94% humidity it, and then the wind on top. <laughs> Yeah. You can go like, oh yeah, okay, winter, get the boots out. Yeah, I can imagine though, it's a, it must be a nice place to live. Obviously, you wouldn't live there if 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 you didn't like it. It's funny how the I you know I came here just because I had a good friend, a drummer. Mm-hmm. <laughs> My old friend Toby Dammit, I know as Larry, uh, but Toby uh, Larry was uh, living here in Berlin. Uh, Larry is was playing with uh, Jesse. The Evans at the time, mm-hmm. but he played he played with Iggy Pop quite a few times, and he ended up playing with the Stooges uh, on their last outing. Oh. Um, I've known Larry for ages, and he I just phoned him. I was in France, uh, you know, banshees had stopped, uh, and my, my life was changing rapidly. We can talk about that if you want. <laughs> um, and I just phoned Larry. I said, "Where are you, Larry? Your suit, your shoes sound really good. Where are you?" I can hear his footsteps. Going, he says, well, I'm just outside my apartment here on the, uh, uh, what was it now? It's like a cop bus at all. Uh, one of the, one of the, on the canal bank. And I eventually got there and it was like cobblestones and gas lights. They look like a kind of Amsterdam. And, um, it's very romantic in, in the winter when it, even when it's cold, it is because Berlin, of course, was isolated for so long that, it's changing now, but back you know ten years ago, there was still too much, too many trees, too much grass in the where it shouldn't be, you know, and a very like laid back way of dealing with a city. Um, so that appealed. Mm, mm. Well, it sounds amazing, and um, I've probably seen your friend on drums with the Stooges. Then w- would he been with them in their last outing about oh gosh about eight years ago, something like that, nine years ago maybe. Was it, that, it could be that long ago. Yeah. Um, well before, it was leading up into lockdown because after the Stooges, he started to get involved in this production here called uh, Babylon Berlin. Or oh. Berlin Babylon. He's the, he was the drummer in that, which is yeah. a period piece. Right, okay. Um, here we are. Let's do a promotion of Toby's career. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the way it works. He'll thank me for it. He, holds it, he makes great coffee. He turns me on to good coffee. So, oh, well, lots to be said for that. But I've definitely seen yeah. the Stooges uh, in the last 
Probably eight years, though. He's possibly. I'll tell you one little anecdote. He said he, so. He got the call because he'd played with, I say, with a rendition of Iggy's in Iggy's band, one of his many, and it was from our old friend uh, Henry McGrogan, who's looking after Iggy's uh, certainly his, his live stuff, if not his business stuff. Um, and I'd known Henry since John Henry days. Mm. Uh, Henry, John Henry, uh, back in London. And Henry McGrogan used to look after Glenn Matlock and the Rich Kids. Yeah. And so we've known each other a while. Anyway, he got called from and said, like, uh, what are you doing? And Larry said, well, well, you know, in between, probably something or another. And it was uh, that he's not with us anymore. The original drummer with the Stooges. Um, he just Ashton. got, he just got, uh, yeah, Scott Ashton. Is it Scott? Is it Scott? I think it is, isn't it? Or is it? I can't remember. Oh, come, uh, anyway, I'm sorry, yeah. you know. Jews, sorry, it's uh, I'll pay my Jews to uh, look it up properly. But it, it was just that he got a call out of the blue and said, "We we got a gig in two days' time. We need the drummer, and you're, you're the other one Iggy wants." So he said he got into the rehearsal room. There was no kind of like marking things through. They turned everything up full on. So I plowed into it two hours, got pro, what, pro back into it, and he said it was just, it was exhausting. Yeah, I just I imagine, imagine. It full on. Yeah. 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 yeah, just like the banshees, really. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but look, what what are you what are you up to at the moment, Budgie? Are you are you up to your eyes in music at the moment, or very much, yeah, but not mine. <laughs> well, it's I, music. Uh, yeah. well, you see, I, I moved here. I, I just met the lady who's now my wife, and we've since had two children. And somehow they've managed to grow into an 11 year old and an eight year old. My, my daughter's 11, my little boy's eight. Yeah. And um, they both play music. He, my son uh, is studying trumpet, it's a small trumpet because he's only small. And then his music teacher said, ah, they're doing um, auditions for uh, not playing, but the, the opera. That's the States Opera here in the center of Berlin. And he went along and he got himself apart. And so I spent the last four weeks injured because I had a back injury. But I've just been taking him to uh, his rehearsals. And um, it's just that stepping into the theatre world, mm. and especially the opera theatre world, where there's a lot of money involved. Yeah. It's no expense spared. You know, an army of people building and constructing and making props and makeup and costume. I'm I'm just going. I love this place. I I know. I now like counter tenors, and I love uh, opera Berlin opera canteen food. (laughs) So, (laughs) um, it really has. I found it very inspiring because yes, I have got um, a new project um, with my dear old friend uh, Lal Tolhurst. Uh, original drummer with The Cure, um, founder of The Cure. And we've had the podcast, Curious Creatures podcast, for the like, last year, year and a half. Um, and we did an album as well, which yeah. turned into an album, an album album, which yeah. we were not really expecting. Um, and we're just really, we, we've been very patient waiting to um, find the right way to do things. Um the, the way we thought we'd have to do it was just go, you know, as soon as lockdown finished, get everything going. Um, and I think the podcast has kind of given us a little more um, space, breathing space to give things, or let, I was going to say give things more thought, but I realized that that's not what's happening. We're not doing too much thinking. We're just allowing things to take shape as it dictated to us, really. Mm. Um, and that's a big change for us both because we both worry a lot. And, you know, we're just like, come, let's just go like, call, phone everybody now. And um, kind of the way the way our bands used to work. Yeah. There was never any downtime with the Banshees. I don't think there was for the early Cure either. Yeah, yeah. Um, we just never stopped. Uh, we paid the price for that, I think. So perhaps, mm. you know, I feel I'm in the uh, you know, the. I wouldn't say the final act, but certainly one of the later acts of, uh, you know, this music industry life that seems to have chosen me, not me chosen me. Yeah. 
so it's kind of happening a bit more organically then, would you say, that the the the, uh, the, the podcast? Yes, I'm uh, feeling very organic. I'm feeling biological and organical. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, Budgie, if you don't mind, because there's there's a lot to get through with you. Can can we go back to your your youthful days in Merseyside and 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 to kind of where it all begin or began, I should say, if you don't mind. Yes. Um, I was recently on the podcast talking to Martin Atkins, who was somebody I never knew, and and now it feels like a long lost brother because we spoke about our upbringing, him in Durham, and me up in not far from you in St Helens. Yes, and um, I was what well, how did it start? It started by play along to the chart rundown. You must have heard this story oh, a hundred yeah. times. You know, Sunday evening chart rundown. You tape it because I had a cassette, little cassette, Marconi phone cassette player <laughs> with a microphone, you know, microphone yeah. stuck to the speaker, you know, no kind of DIs or anything like that. So, you know, along with the dog barking and, you know, somebody say, shout, turn it down, it's rubbish, turn that down. <laughs> uh, that was, uh, you know, uh, Eddie Vegas in a very early rendition. I don't know what he was doing in our house, but um, <laughs> anyway, uh, it, it, I love it. I love his, his, his comedic voice. Because it just reminds me of old St. Ellen's folk. Yeah, yeah. You know what? You know what I mean. Turn it, hey, get out of here, you! Take your bloody hooks. Because um, I, I had to lose all my St. Ellen's, my St. Ellen's accents a lot, because I realised people didn't understand me much when I first went to London or America or anything. Yeah. Um, but it's buzzes. Um, <laughs> oh That's yeah, get on buzz. Get on buzz. <laughs> He's. I can't remember. Eh. I was I was Clarke at school. Clarke, not Clarkey. Do you went to Liverpool? You Clarkey? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. But, you know, I'd, I'd be Budger in in St Helens and Budgie in Liverpool. Yeah, it's funny, isn't it? So and, close uh, together uh, as well. So, um, really, it was um, I. What happened? None of it. It's very early on. I mean, I'm, I'm writing. And put, I've done, always been writing as well. My, my thoughts about my childhood and things are, are a lot clearer right now because I've been looking at it. And um, my mum passed away suddenly when I was 12. Mm -hmm. And it kind of um, changed everything, of course. I, I realise now how much it changed everything. But I also realised that my mum was the one who said, like, you want to be home by six, you know, five o'clock, get your tea, you know, your homework done. Um, and I kind of forgot that. So I don't think I would have been, you know, joining up with some lads who were like younger than me, like 10, 11, 12, to play in a cabaret band that played the, you know, the working men's clubs and conservative clubs around St. Helens, Warrington, Liverpool, we didn't get much beyond the Merseyside district, but for us, we were on world tours. You know, we used to go Friday, Saturday, Sunday, every weekend, sometimes more. And it'd be about, I think, about 25 quid, 30 quid. There's a lot of money. We could yeah. split that. <laughs> we'll yeah. pay the petrol cost. And then you'd, you know, by times that by three. Um, but you'd roll in at two or three o'clock in the morning, you know. Uh, because you know, the van always broke down, or you just never got out of the club. Or um, and that was my early days, really, and and that's where I learned to play. I remember my first, uh, you know, sitting at a drum kit. I had an Olympic kit, and it was tied together with string, because you know, because every time I kicked the bass drum, it flew across yeah. the other side of the room. So I had this like really nice nylon string round the drum seat, round the hi hat, and around the bass drum anchors. And it had one tom and one floor tom and two zin cymbals. And I was at the Bottle Ditton Club in Witness on a Sunday afternoon. I know that Probably club. Not, I... Yeah, I know the club. <laughs> Probably... Is it still there? I, I believe it was. it was. It was a few years ago, put it that way, yeah. Okay, so Sunday afternoon, audition probably. I'm, I'm with Chuck and the Young Ones. Chuck is Chuck Richardson. That's not his real name. I don't never knew his real name, but maybe I did. Um, and he was cross between Cliff Richard and Elvis Presley, you know, with dyed black hair, lots of quite quite dark makeup. Uh, a very unusual sight in St. Helens in those days. And uh, Chuck was just like always a showman. Um, that, he, he, he felt like he was a mature showman. He was probably 20, <laughs> something like that, maybe. 
And uh, the curtain's up, and I'm setting the drums up, and uh, the organist and the drummer, or organist and something, started playing. It was a, a, a older lady and a, and a man, man and wife, I believe. And I was oh, shit. I said, it's okay, just just play, just play. And I, dum chet, dum chet, dum chet, dum chet. It's all I could do, bum chet, bum chet, bum chet. I knew about the ding, da da ding, da da ding, but I didn't know how to do it very well. Um, and there was probably like three people in the, this huge club and I was head down, you know, just, and that was it. That was it really. It was a, a baptism of not really fire, you know, properly drunk and uh, Sunday afternoon drunk. <laughs> um, it was all go from that point on really. I, I, I did the cabaret for about maybe, I don't know, a year, maybe, maybe longer. Cause, because of course, like any band, we had aspirations as young kids to be, I wanted to be John Bonham or mm. Ringo Starr. And um, and we wanted to play Black Sabbath and Jimi Hendrix, stuff like that. We didn't want to play Nat King Cole anymore. Oh, no, no. no. Stop loving you. And, uh, and, and and the hits of the day, like Tie a Yellow Ribbon and Not Three Times on the... And if I hear Not Three Times on the Ceiling, if you... One more time, I will... Uh, I'll have to... Um, just give up completely. But um, there was, I learned a lot. I realized how much I learned from playing the Safaris Wipeout or trying to. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I learned a lot from playing slow ballads because the, the first set began with slow listening songs. Then it got a little bit kind of more pop songs. No, it finished with a rock and roll pop set, you know. We did three, three uh, I think, three half hour sets a night. Kind of getting on for cure, kind of area uh, realer, isn't it? You know, mm. they just put them all together. No, it's like a 90 minute set, isn't it? Um, and then I stopped, I just stopped because we, you know, we couldn't get any gigs without Chuck and we'd sat him. <laughs> <laughs> or should I say, I think it was more like the parents down the street sat him, you know, the uh, the, 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 they know who they are, they 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 wanted the more for their young boys, and um, you know. I just had my dad, and my dad was just kind of cool with, well, if he keeps you happy, you know, if you're happy, then that's good. So I stopped and went to art college, and in art college in St. Helens, I was doing my foundation course because I wasn't old enough to go to proper college. And I met these guys who'd been away and come back, and they were older than me. And they were, every evening, we'd sit around and they'd play, like, I didn't know who they were, but they were playing Velvet Underground songs. Mm -hmm. So I was hearing some of these things, Waiting for the Man and Sister Ray and Heroin and, you know, run, 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 take a drink or two. And um, I was thinking, these are great songs. Who is, who is this guy? And I realized it wasn't Ken, you know, my mate Ken, um, uh, who, who wrote these songs. I didn't find out until I got to Liverpool and met a couple of guys from St. Helens who came knocking on my door when I was trying to be a serious art student. Mm -hmm. And going, I don't play music. I don't listen to music anymore. I, I stopped when Bowie came along, although I secretly listened to him. I got into um, Brian Eno, and I used to do self-portraits to Another Green World and The Evening Star. Right. Um, very, um, very somber, somber green reptile I was. <laughs> um, and these guys knocked on the door of my, my I was one room in a house in Eggbus, um, and uh, they said, we're playing tonight at this, uh, um, uh, it, was either, it was either Wigan, or they were playing like Eric's, so they actually were playing anyone, they just wanted to be playing somewhere. Yeah, yeah. And anyway, the story I remember, the night I remember, is when we were supposed to be down at Eric's in Matthew Street, opening for a band called Susie and the Banshees, who I didn't really know about. And uh, didn't get the gig, mm -hmm. but I remember seeing them. And Holly was down there, and what would be my future members of Big in Japan. Who, mm. But that was the Spitfire Boys. That was the beginning of that. So I hadn't played drums for a good few years, maybe four, four years. And I thought, never thought much of it. So I was never a, an aspiring drummer. I liked it, but I thought, well, you can't, you know, as my dad would say, you know, well, you can't make a living out of that, can you? <laughs> and then when John went to the art college, he went, well, you can't make a living doing that, can you? <laughs> <laughs> can't win. <laughs> we can't, can't win now, if we're not trying. Um, 
I wanted a job in communications, and they said, go work for British Telecom. And I thought, no, it's not quite what I had in mind. Mm. Um, too many wires, you know. <laughs> I, I picked up the drums originally because I liked setting up music stands. I was probably one of those kids that could set up a, a dead chair on the beach at Blackpool. But um, I, I liked music stands. I could figure out how they all folded and unfolded. So when I saw a drum kit and all these little... Not you know because they were tiny, weren't they? Then the yeah. symbol stands, like, like not these Meccano. big chunky things. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's more like Meccano. You have to have delicate little fingers, and they yeah. always broke. <laughs> so uh, I liked building drum kits, and I had to do a lot of that because I never really owned one. Hmm. All the time was in uh, Ericsson in Liverpool. I bought a drum kit. I bought a Beverly. It just looked. I still have it. Really? And that was the kit. That, wow. Yep. I have a, I have two I Beverly still, snare drums. I love them. Yeah, oh, wow. I've got the snare drum, and I think I've got the kick drum and the floor tom, and the, there was two rack toms. Um, I wanted, I thought, I saw they cut, you know, the, the bottom head came off, and they had this, like, polo mint bottom head, hmm. you know, with a hole cut in it, and I spray painted them silver for some stupid reason, which went over everything. I sprayed my cases as well, the Premier Fiber cases, sprayed silver. And they covered everything they touched. <laughs> um, they stayed with, stayed with me, and uh, I used them on the first Slits album. Yeah, ah, really? Okay. Yeah. Ah. They found their moment. Mm. They, they went from St. Helens Cabaret to like Ridge Farm in Surrey for the first Slits album cut. That's really and cool, I, was, I have to say. <laughs> and it, it sounded it, I was great made on up. that album. Wow. Yep. It's a, it's a, it still amazes me that recording. Um, but prior to that, I, I don't I don't think I had them in Liverpool. So I was borrowing some of these Premier kids or um, guys who played ended up playing with Nightmares in Wax with Pete Burns or uh, I think one of the guys who worked behind the bar in uh, in Eric's he had a lovely twenty four inch Premier kit, twenty four inch bass drum, mm. and I loved that. It reminded me I could pretend I was Jerry Shirley in Humble Pie. <laughs> Because I had a lot of live, excuse me, live albums. One of which was Humble Pie Rock in the Fillmore performance, yeah, yeah. which I just loved. I used to put that on as loud as I could get it on my brother's old damn set in a record player. And I just think it's one of the most amazing live recordings. And Jerry Shirley, who must have been all of 19 or yeah. 20 when he joined in Humble Pie. It's got this amazing style of hitting the crash symbol and the snare before he goes into a roll. Yeah, yeah. So he goes, one da da ba da ba da da It was always like, and as if that symbol gave him the room to then roll under. I thought, I never realized until years later, I thought, that's what he was doing. Kind of like opening the hi hat to give yeah. you, to cover yourself as you went off the keeping the time whilst you did a roll. So much stuff that you pick up without realising it, you know. Mm. Mm. Oh, that's that's the way it is, isn't it? And and it, that, again, it's back to the organic thing. You you just you just soak it in like a sponge, and then well, I think that's the way it works. And that's the way it should work. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so after the Spitfires, was it was it big in Japan? Pretty much immediately after that, or was that after the Slits? I've got my timeline bit back to the front. Yeah, well, it was the uh, Spitfire Boys, uh, and then I think Paul and Holly were friends. Paul was a singer in Spitfires, and then everybody was just like in and out of everything. Yeah. If you read Julian Cope's head on, you know, it's like it gives you some impression. Uh, and Julian's story, of course, was Echo and the Bunny Man, Theater of Explodes, Dalek, I Love You, uh, Orchestral Maneuvers in the Dark. These bands kind of came up really after I'd left Liverpool. Yes. So my stint there was, you know, about eight months with Big in Japan. Um, it really was like a they had the t three piece Bill Drummond and uh, Kevin and Phil. Um, is it Phil or Steve? It's Phil, Steve Allen's brother from Deaf School. Mm -hmm. And um, then they got Jane Casey in, in vocals. And then it all started to get like, hang on, you know, we need real people as if like I was like a better drummer than Steve and probably wasn't um it was just uh more to do with putting personalities together i think yeah. and and but we really did all those hours of 
Eric's gave us the facility to rehearse every day and write. And so we learned how to rehearse and write, really, we, you know, and, and gig. But we just never learned how to sign a record deal. <laughs> Because but we we got to yeah, Amazon it was it Amazon Studios out in yeah Kirby or somewhere yes yeah yeah but it's because Clive was Langer thinking. was in the band at one point wasn't he well if you could count Ian Brody as Clive Langer yeah because Ian, Ian was Clive um, was definitely right there mentoring us right so he wasn't, I, he wasn't I, a member of the band then as such no not not officially I okay. mean we even had. Uh, Steve Lindsay, uh, Frank, you know, mm. Frankie Average, uh, bass player with Deaf School. I think me and he, I think me and Ian and Average, Average, we did like some gigs uh, around Liverpool as the Secrets or something. You know, we we're always making everybody's making names up for bands that didn't exist. <laughs> the most famous being like the Crucial Three: yeah, Pete yeah. Wiley, Ian McCulloch, Julian Cope. I'm, I think I was in there at one point. We never played anyone. We just talked about it. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Wouldn't it be great if we had this band? Uh, there must have been a, like a huge passion at that time for music because it, it must have been pretty exciting. And 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 obviously you you didn't know what was ahead for any of you. And it was, and let's be honest, big in Japan, it was big stuff for all of you ahead, wasn't it? You know, Ian, Holly, had the whole stuff. band. Everyone went. But on we had no. My memories of it are sitting in the Cardona Cafe, you know, with a um, a spudgy like oh. between four, you know. Right. Like going, well, oh God, you went you went more yesterday, and <laughs> can we afford a cup of tea? It was really uh, we had no money, uh, but we had a lot of I don't know, just belief somehow. It wasn't even a belief. It was just that's what we thought. Okay, we're going to do this. I'm going to do it together. And we were serious about it. Um, and we fought a lot. And there was a lot of back, you know, bickering. Because Jane never thought of it as, as as seriously as, say, Ian. Ian was in his bedroom writing songs with Ambrose and other people around, the dead birds. There was all these little bad offshoots. Um, Bill Drummond was really driven, um, and, and that shows really that Bill never stopped from when the band stopped. He was off into managing Echo and the Bunny Men and forming Zoo Records. Mm. Uh, Dave Baltz came in on the tail end of Big in Japan, and used, it was that springboard for him to get involved in the music business as well. Myself, I um, I don't know how, but I think I, through Clive, um, Clive was based in London, he met up with, he got involved in the Slits album, okay. in, the, in the writing, the early part of it, along with Dick O'Dell and other people who were trying to manage the girls yeah. and trying to get their songs sorted. Yeah. And and it was so, through Clive Langer, Frank Silver, who was Deaf School's manager, and a chap called Glenn Matlock, mm. who was the Sex Pistols bass player. Yep. And so it, it was Glenn that, got my number from from Frank and Clive and called me down to London to help him do some demos mm -hmm. in Warner Brothers' uh, writing room in London, in Barrick Street, I think it was, um, because we had a mutual interest. Uh, it's, a, it's a convoluted story, but uh, so I ended up working with probably the most famous bass player at that time in the UK. Yeah. <laughs> Sitting writing, going, oh yeah, I could put this beat with that bass line, Glenn. Uh, but we love playing pool together, and we, you know, and drinking together, and and then eventually, let's see. I I think I'd done the slits album. and I I Frank ended up managing the slits. Mm -hmm. I, I knew them already, and I knew Bob Olive, who was the original drummer and the founder of the, of the slits. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just knew the them as. But not not personally as people, not I knew them in you know well, but I was aware of the music. I knew what the what the, the, the their passion, if you like, and mm. the energy. And I just thought it was my job to somehow give a bit of stability in the studio. Yeah, and I, and that's really what I tried to do. And, but and I also got to go on. I got to go on tour with sorry with the class on the sort it out tour and watching Topper every night. Wow, you know, that was that was serious education for me. 
I mean, that album is is a legendary album. There's no uh, there's no doubting. You know, it, it's it's in so many people's top ten albums. That one. Uh, I know a load of people, and 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 it's a lot higher up for them. But musically, it's pretty astounding, isn't it? Let's be honest. With the styles, different styles. Um, you know. It, it, the reggae thing going on. I mean, where did you, where did you, is that come from just a bit of everything from the cabaret, from the, you know, from the Spitfires? Is it just, you know? I realise looking now because I can sort of put it into perspective. Um, no, we never touched reggae in the cabaret. Hmm. It, it, it was, it was not the generation were not listening to it. Hmm. My youth at school, I went, I was, I was a skinhead. Hmm. I had shaved partings and barafia and parallels, and the music was reggae chartbusters. Okay. It was it was Desmond Decker, it was Lee Scratch Perry, it was uh, Martha Reed and Van Dallas, it was uh, it was Young Gifted and Black. There was it, it, it was reggae was huge, mm. and excuse me a minute. I never played it, but I. Had it, it when we got to Liverpool to Eric's again, it, reggae arrived in a different guise. It came from, um, oh, I'm gonna forget his name. Um, ah, oh, can't remember, I can't remember. It was basically the American and Jamaican DJs. Mm -hmm. Um, coal came running around my brain. Dum, 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 dum. I cannot think of his name, it doesn't matter. But um, there was a lot of heavy dub coming in. And Roger Regal, who ran Eric's, who ran the Twisted Wheel prior to that in Manchester, was importing a lot of this heavy dub reggae, yeah. which we were playing through choice down at Eric's. Yeah. That's what we We didn't want to pogo. We wanted to kind of chill out to these reggae rhythms. And so really, it wasn't... Uh, when, um, when the Slits signed to Ireland... Um, we rehearsed because the songs were already written. I realized just how much they were, uh, they'd formed, hmm. uh, what they were going to record because I just heard the John Peel session. Yeah. Not then, but just now. Yeah. I just, <laughs> I heard it pretty much for the first time. So I'm hearing Love and Romance and, um, uh, uh, FM and stuff. Um, but we, we were rehearsing in the basement of Island Records in St. Peter's Square in London. And that was the first port of call for musicians coming in from Jamaica. Right. Okay. They go and find their, their mates and friends at Island Records because they'd probably been brought over by Island to do a session or maybe doing a talk. And I'm sitting there with all these, like, you know, brothers from Jamaica, like skinning up a huge spliff, going like, no, man. No, don't do that. No, the beat's wrong, man. No, come on. Hey, you got to get it on. And I'm going, oh, shit. And and then they're teaching me. And they're not teaching me like cod reggae, you know. Yeah. It's the stuff that they're doing now, you know, then, mm. in 1978, in Jamaica, in the studio. And because if you listen to the development of just Lee Perry's kind of anthology, the, the music and the drum especially, it really, it's not what, it's not just, you know, dropping the one. Mm. It's not like putting all the emphasis on it, all that, that's the kind of cliche, but it works. There's a lot more going on, a lot more freedom. Um, but it, of course, it's not isolated. It's not just the drum, it's just what everything else is playing as well. So but then we had the the brilliance of, um, of Blackbeard, of um, <laughs> um, Bovell, Dennis, Dennis Bovell. Mm -hmm. And really, I think it's, it was Dennis who persevered with me to get, if you like, it, to rock it steady. Yeah, yeah. Because prior to that, I'd been speeding up on the choruses. That was the natural inclination before click track of everybody. You kind of like I powered the choruses, I went a little louder, went on for a ride symbol, and then came back and tightened it up and sat back a bit on the verses. Well, of course, the, the the music we were doing there was kind of just down, steady, straight, and that's what he taught me and and encouraged me. And then when the girls had like gone out the studio, Dennis would come. Can we go and play some rock and roll? 
and he had all this like rock and roll songs he wanted to play and like going ding da ding da ding da ding and that was and then Dennis having a bit of a laugh afterwards. But um I I realised also it's the sound. I didn't recognise a lot of the sounds of uh, my drum kit. Because mm. he he mixed it in a way that was just leading the way to a lot of experimentation. He was taking in elements of dub. And also, I didn't realize, and you know, many years later, you, you, you hear the story from Dennis, that he was working back to back. He was in London doing Linton Kwesi Johnson's album, Forces oh, right, of Victory. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And then in the daytime, he'd come down to Ridge Farm and do the Slits Cut. And so that he, he would be kind of drawing from one source and applying it to the other. And of course, Forces of Victory was an album that when I joined the band years later, we would play that when we had Linton on tour with us, along with John Cooper Clark. Um, but it was already with me. I mean, I, I was almost there in the studio, having the same producer in the same time space. And so there was a course, uh, for me, it was a cross thing between those reggae rhythms and the accuracy of Topper's rock yeah. beats. Yeah. And so, and also things like do a runner. Okay. So that comes from Drumbo, Captain B Fart, Clear Spot. Oh, right. Okay. Right. I know the song. Direct, <laughs> direct lift. Which one is it? Is it Big Eye Beans from Venus? It probably is. And I, it, it's like subconscious lifting, you know. Um, That's the way it the works. Beat was already, yeah, the beat was already there. The gap was already ready for something. And that's what I tried to do. Yeah. I don't think I, yeah, slightly slowed down. And then, of course, Dennis then starts to gate it and mix it so it doesn't sound like that particular beat. And I think that's how we find new ways of thinking about what we do. Yeah. Um, so that that really was my period with uh, the slits. I left, you know, almost before the mixing was finished. Yeah. Well, I did leave before the mixing was done. And I didn't leave to go and join anybody. I just left because I needed, I don't know, I never actually thought about what do I do next, but I knew I wasn't going to, I'd done what I'd set out to do in a way. And it wasn't easy leaving. But then Glenn Matlock called me and I ended up playing drums for a few dates around both clubs north of London with Steve New, who was the Rich Kids guitarist to be. Yeah. Uh, Danny Custo, who was Tom Robinson's guitar player, okay. who played a mean Les Paul with two, four, six, eight, bolt away. Oh, yeah. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. And that, if you check out the guitar parts of that, you know, it's a natural born rhythm rock guitarist and yeah. Danny I love Danny to death and um and Glenn basically writing songs that would find their way into Rich Kids and find their way into Iggy Pop's Soldier album I think yeah. Yeah. and we did a Peel session of the Jimmy Norton Explosion I don't know where the name came from wow. but um I got to make my debut playing harmonica on um on a John really? Peel session and I've got a cassette of it at the yeah. end John Peel says, oh, play that harp, boy. <laughs> play that harp, boy. And I thought, John Peel recognised my harp play. And he played, and he said harp, not gobbin or harmonica, because Captain Beefheart would have played harp. Yeah. <laughs> is is gobbin so, a northern thing, I wonder? I, 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 I think it must be, yeah. Think it is, yeah. Stick it in your gob. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, so I'm thinking, of, if I had, like, notches, you know, that, there's two right there, there's, you know, being in the slits, being on a first major label recording for me, and then immediately I'm doing a John Peel session. Yeah, with Glenn, Glenn and Danny and, and Steve. Um, and the story then was we did a few gigs, then nothing much happened, and it was coming to the end of my time with Frank in the Camden Town. Dennis Stect. Um, I got a call from uh, another manager. I got called from two managers. One was the manager of the Psychedelic Furs. Mm -hmm. I think her name was Tracy. And I just thought, because it was a female voice on the phone, it must be another girl band. And I thought, 
I've just done probably worked with one of the <laughs> yeah <laughs> arduous relationships. Uh, you know, it, it, it's tough. It was hard work. You know, but, but I was I was made honorary female of the band. You know, um, <laughs> and I thought, no, no, I, I need to do something different. I didn't know the first were even to later Richard and and John and all the rest of them. But um, so I, I turned that down. I just didn't follow up on it. And then Neil Stevenson called me and said, um, I, I need a drummer for my, I said, he said, for my band. I said, which one? And it, because I, Frank managed several bands and several artists. And I just thought all managers must have more than one band. And I knew because he said, it's Susie and the Banshees. And I said, well, they're out on tour because I'd seen him and the melody maker and the, and the me and and he said yeah we got a problem because <laughs> of course the story is that John Mackay and Kenny Morris left about two or three dates into their UK tour for their second album and um, anyway that was so I said okay and I said well, can you get down for an audition I think it was I was recommended by um, Paul Cook Pistols oh, drummer wow okay because Paul had heard uh, takes of uh, cut because mm-hmm. Paul and you know John and Ari and all they were all kind of that that was the the Pistols kind of camp really, mm-hmm. um, and Mills was sharing a, a flat uh, in Central London with Paul, so he said you should give this guy a call and apparently that's how I got to be pulled into that one, yeah. um, but the first audition. Well, the audition. There wasn't more than one. I don't know if they, if they had any other drummers lined up, <laughs> but I was down there, and the only person that could play with uh, Susie and Severin at that point would be Marco Peroni, who was uh, the Ants guitarist, mm-hmm. but he was the first guitarist with Sid Vicious at the Hundred Club. So I didn't know that. Right there we go. <laughs> so Marco was the only one who had any idea of what the songs might sound like, but he didn't know their new songs, which is the ones we were about to play. But he knew what type of guitaring they had, they would be using or perhaps for the early stuff. And I just really turned into Palm Olive. I thought, well, Palm Olive would suit this gig really well. And I kind of, so I didn't come in with reggae from Cut Album. I, or, you know, I just started, almost took the hi-hat away, which Susie eventually did take the hi-hat away. She did what, not want any hairspray on her recordings. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, but I got it back eventually. But I was just thrashing eight on the floor, Tom. Yeah. And um, I think it was a kick drum that sold me, I think. Yeah. I was always big on the bass drum um, yeah. from bon- Bonham, early Bonham stuff. You can hear that. And it wasn't necessarily uh, Bonham's speed or dexterity on the bass drum. What I really liked, you know, actually, it's more likely a cross between Bonham and the Glitter Band. Mm. And the, I think the Glitter Band were the biggest influence. And it's bum, bum, bum. Relentless. And that's the bass drum. Yeah. yeah. That bass drum went right the way through from Glitter Band to my early days with the Banshees and in between disco. Mm. Because, of course, disco, which became dance which became what we're listening to today, that bass drum has come all the way from, I'd say, I'd say Sweet, yeah. Gary Glitter. Yeah. All those set at late, late, mid to late 70s. Because, for instance, T-Rex were not using that. Mm. It was boom, boom, cat, boom, boom, cat. There was yeah, still yeah. that kind of feel. Will Legend, my legend, because when he played Cosmic Dancer and did those eight note fills i spent hours trying to do that get that speed up but it's interesting that development of the bass drum and how it snuck in and stayed there all the way through right the way through to we are today really yeah. including reggae well do you know you know you mentioned about the the, the, the hi-hat was taken away you're known mm. for having you, you write parts you're not just a four on the floor nothing wrong with that but you write parts um uh, for for example, hybrid, you know, um, just it's just interesting stuff. It's nice to hear, you know. It's it's not just boring. Is that was that always the the, the um, 
the thing you were going to do, or is it because it just seems, yeah, you're a, you're you're a parts player. Does that make sense? You're a part. It does to me. Uh, I mean, coming from the cabaret where I realised there's two parts to the songs, yeah. the chorus and the verse. And it always kind of tended to do the same thing. And when somebody sits down at a drum kit, they cross their arms and, you know, they pl try and play the hi-hat and get the snare drum in at the same time, as if that was some necessity. It was because of left feet and right feet, I suppose. And and there was, and, and I realized how freeing it was to go onto the ride symbol. And I wasn't clever enough to do anything with a hi-hat at the time. So it kind of went redundant and I thought, hang on. I've got a left foot. So I, I'm, I'm, I saw Ginger Baker very early on for that Farewell Queen tour. And there was yeah. a film that came on local cinemas or the BBC. I think there's a BBC guy. Yeah, so Ginger, could you give us a demonstration of your um, of what you do around the drum kit? And the first thing you hear is in like going left foot on the second bass drum, going bum, 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 bum. And all he's doing is throwing... He's got the eight going on his left foot. I thought, that's what you need to be doing. And later I see Ginger Baker talking about how many drummers he sees who don't move the left foot. Mm. And he said, to me, it was him, it was heel up. And, tick, 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 tick. and I used that so much. And I put a tambourine on the hi-hat to get more emphasis and more color by then stopping and then bringing the hi-hat in. I even wanted to get a throb action for the tambourine, but that was another, another story that never happened. But writing parts, I suppose I was writing with Ian Brody quite early. Yeah. And we didn't have a bass player in full time at that point. And so, and this happened with the Banshees as well, where um, I'd write with uh, John Carruthers, but that's later on. Um, and so really you're trying to make a baseline, really, yeah, yeah. a bit of a baseline up, which is kind of so the four on the floor gives you the weight, the, the kind of discipline of it, the, the movement, and then it's like throwing in toms, but not fill, not kind of here comes the chorus kind of fill, mm -hmm. but you're making a pattern up, a pattern for the verse and a pattern for the chorus, and I've just been listening to people like Terry Chambers with XTC, mm. yeah, I, right so, uh, but you know if you listen to the, the biggest single, Making Plans for Nigel. Yeah. And you'll hear that kind of hi-hat used as a tom. Because mm -hmm. you hear the tom played, and then you hear the same pattern with a hi-hat. And you also hear it starting up where you can't figure out where the one is. Yeah, yeah. Which, is, I, which I love, and I, and I hate right. at the same time. Because I think, how did he do that? Why, why would he do that? And I always count and. I never count one, two. I always go and that, and one. So I, but I, but, 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 I'm always putting the end before the, the one of the of the bar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and and I realise, God, there's a lot. There's a lot of information in our theatre, but it's it's good. It doesn't follow in, in other cultures. When I played with Leonard uh, Eto, the Japanese ta taiko drummer, he read the one from the first note I played, as many would, and that's what confused me when I hear making plans for Nigel. So it's only you have to know what, who you're playing with. So really, that's the development of writing parts was um, filling out the bits that might be filled by the guitarist and the bass player when they got in on the act, you know, yeah, yeah. and making my own life more interesting than just marking time. Well, that's a big part of it, isn't it? You know also what it is, uh, Matty, it's that I never learned the rudiments. Hmm. Uh, and so I never knew how to break time up in the, the prescribed way that jazz players have been known for decades. My heroes were swing drummers like Bill Ward and Ian Pace. Yes. They swung through heavy metal, but not wasn't metal, it's heavy rock, but they boom, 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 ba -da -ba -da boom, 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 boom. There's that bow, boom, the end. And I, that's the stuff that's going through my head. I, I'm swinging and people are going, stop swinging. Like, I'm like, that's what I do. Um, and that gives you a little edge on things as well, because American drummers, they're, they're knocking steel bolts into the one. And, the, <laughs> and I'm not. I'm kind of tapping something that might just about land on the one. You know? um, all this 
really, if, if, I, if I had to like, you know, round the story up quickly at this point, I'd say that's what caused the creatures to happen. Yeah, well, yeah, it leads nicely into that, doesn't it? Because that must have been, I mean, that the first full album must have been just a joy to do for a drummer. <laughs> You know, maybe maybe less so vocally, uh, but for a drummer, wow! It's just like the world's your oyster, isn't it? Oh yeah, you're in the toy shop. You've got all the sweets that you can imagine. Uh, the only limitation, uh, first of all, the creatures came out of the Banshees. It came out of uh, the second album was with John McGeoch in the band. We were doing um, Juju. Um, we were probably at the top of the first level of our game and it literally was in rehearsal room where and we Susan and I were messing around with a vocal idea and I had this fast tom thing with a kick drum down 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 and um she was singing and Severin and Miggy up came back in they just come out for put the kettle on literally and said that sounds great and and that was it. We just we were, we recorded it as part of Juju. We yeah. we, we did it on with uh, uh, the kit I'd adopted of Kenny Morris. Still, I was using the old Pearl kit, so it had very damp sounding drums. And we played that song in the middle of the Banshee set on that tour. Yeah. Um, and it was only after that I think that we decided we got a weekend where we could go with. Um, try a new producer. So we went with Mike Hedges for the first time, who'd been producing The Cure, I think, at that point. And he had a studio in Camden Town Playground. And I just got the Gretsch kit without getting too heavily into well, kit he using. Um, <laughs> the Gretsch the kit. <laughs> well, I, we didn't, it wasn't a kit. It wasn't like sitting in the shop window. It was like somebody said, I've got these Gretsch shells. And there was a 14 by 14 and a 15 by big. <laughs> this is 14, 15, 18 floor tom. That was it, a three tom kit, but it was 14, 15, 18, um, and a 22 inch bass drum. And if it was a 24 inch bass drum, that 15 wouldn't have sat no. anywhere. It was so big. And Terry with XTC had huge concert toms, if I remember correctly. A lot of drummers, we had big toms then because we thought that was the way to go. But I tuned the heads really high. And and I realized when, again, when you get to like YouTube years and you can watch John Bonham's old drum tech talking you through how he tuned the, that kit, that he tuned the top, the top head pretty tight and lowered the tension on the bottom head. Mm -hmm. And you get it when you hear it, you understand it more because you think they'd be slack and hit really hard. Mm. And he said, no, that, it, I, and this is also the principle of Japanese drums. They're like it's like hitting hitting a, a, a sort of responsive concrete wall. <laughs> the head is so tight. Yeah, it's not at all like 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 rubber. It's like a fifty-year-old buffalo hide stretched yeah. as tight as it can go, and the tighter the better. And the what and and it throws you off. So, so I didn't realize any of this stuff, but I, I started to tune the drums to, to notes. You can hear my cat trying to get out of the room. Um, <laughs> let me out of here. He's talking drums again. <laughs> um, no, but I, I realized that I could make a tune-up. The, 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 the bongos I had on the left, above the hi-hat on cut became timbales. Yes. And because I had these big toms, the 14, 15 were even tuned high, were, were deep. I needed something a bit higher up. So I had space as well to develop. I had this free uh, real estate up on the left hand side. So I put a, four, a 13 and a 14 timbali up there. And so then I had this bong, bong, boom, 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 boom. And I had an octave between the 18 yeah. and the 14. You can boom, hear it. Boom, boom, boom. Boom, 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 boom. And I was going to boom, boom, da dun da 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 boom, boom, da dun da 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 And they got the four on the floor, boom, chip, boom, chip, boom, chip, boom, which is a lift from Jimi Hendrix's Gypsy Eyes. Yep. Boom, chip, boom, chip, boom, chip, boom, chip, boom, chip. And then I start to, without knowing anything about really about time signature, I'm going boom, boom, da dun da 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 boom, boom, da dun da 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 boom, one, two, three, one, two, three. Yeah. I'm thinking, 
Well, I'm not thinking anything. Somebody told me later that that's a pretty good rendition of a three-four, like a, a pure one. Mm. And then if you take me back to the Slips album, then the first track on the Slips album, it opens with a tick, 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 up, 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 one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, yeah, three. Okay. So we're, we're, the album starts with a six, four, and not once did I ever with Viv, Tessa, or Harry talk about time signatures. We never discussed it. Yeah, there's, a, there's a lot of strange timing is going on, especially in the vocal department crossing over a, a, a straight four. And so a lot of it, as we when we started talking today is, as you say, organic. Mm. Um, but does it feel right? And, I, and I, I'm, 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 I feel, sometimes I could feel, oh, I miss so much not knowing those rudiments, you know. I remember Phil Collins saying the same thing, learn to read music. I didn't, and it would have served me well. But would you have been the same player, though? That's the thing. You know, you might have been a totally different player, and, and that's that wouldn't be a good thing, would it? Well, it would be a different thing. Well, it <laughs> might, not, might not be as good, though. Be, no, it's, it, it would... Somebody would... Uh, there was enough of us around, uh, if you like, who were self-taught, hmm. and we'd watch each other, you know. I know that Topper had had... Not, I don't know if he had tuition. In, you know, I never saw him play a rudiment. I never saw him sit down warming up on a practice pad, mm. like I see Chad Smith doing, or uh, the guy from Jane's Addiction, um, whose name escapes me. But, uh, uh, you know, yeah. when I first... Stephen Perkins. Uh, Stephen Perkins. Perkins. Yeah. yeah. When I come, when I first went on the Lollapalooza tour with the Banshees, when we, 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 we were invited by Jane's Addiction, and I see Stephen and all the other American drummers, because they were all American. Mm. We were the only Brits on that tour. And they'd sit around in a circle doing drum circle stuff. <laughs> the, half, the guitarists were doing it too. They all went through drum corps. And they, the guitarists knew paradiddles and flams and four strut rolls or six strut rolls. And I'm just going, oh, shit, I'm going to be revealed as the fraud I am, you know. Um. <laughs> It is so funny, and and I would, but I what I saw from Topper was the certainly the swing mm -hmm. and the, the 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 absolute necessity of keeping of listening and keeping the whole band yeah. centered, and that's what he did without fail every night. Mm. Um, and if you're out there, Topper, <laughs> thank you, yes. because. Uh, yeah, that's, I, I I know he's he's a, he's a very modest man, and um, I don't know if you've spoken to him on this. I ha uh, I haven't, sadly, no. I would love no, to. and well, me too. I'd like to get him on uh, our podcast. Let's let's yeah. make it see if, who who can get tougher <laughs> out first. I think you got more chance um, than I have. Oh, I do. <laughs> no, so uh, so really, that's how. I, I got a lovely compliment um, when I was probably with The Creatures were out. I mean, The Creatures really, as you say, that first album, it, it allowed me to express another part of myself, but in my own way. It didn't have to filter through the band. Yeah. Um, so I'd already started backing the drum tunes up, if you like, with marimba. Yes. And I'd, I'd, so I'd kind of hear, I'd hear the, the approximate note of the drums and then I'd start solidify it with a marimba. And because marimbas are also kind of a yeah. an in-between kind of tuned instrument. You did, know, you, they, did you play all the marimba parts? You played all those? Yeah. yeah. Okay, I didn't know that. Yeah, people, no, people think I can play marimba, but I, I, I have to really work at it to rehearse it. That's line still, by line, still playing you know. it though, isn't it? You know, it, it's of course, it, it's there for everyone. I, to hear. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, say Susie, for instance, gave me that. We had a, a hit. We had, went on top of the pops with marimba and vocals playing Mister Girl, mm. um, and she played the middle eight on the piano. The ding, 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 ding boom. And I remember we were in Hawaii in in C West Studios. And there was an old piano, there was an old drum kit, and the parts of that album, parts of the tune, 
they were dictated when the drums fell to pieces, you know, and I just, oh shit, that's gone. And, um, and then the sticks flew out my hands because it was really hot and sweaty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that would have been the end of that take. And we'd literally do a drum take and pass it on to Susie on the cassette and she'd sit in the uh, uh, little beach house writing words and melodies and come in the next day and we'd record it. We did the whole thing in two weeks. Ridiculous. So, you know. But a lot of, lot of, a lot of Laura laughs, as Silla would say. Indeed. Um, wow. Justin, you've, um, you've had a so phenomenal career, cool. haven't you? You really have. It's been incredible. I'm out of breath. What a journey. <laughs> wow. And I keep thinking, well, what else to do, you know? And, um, but it's actually, um, it's, I, if I, there's always way too much for me to remember. I'm remembering a lot more now. Mm. Um, it, and it's it's all good stuff, you know. I, I I used to only remember thinking, oh, that wasn't too good, and that bit didn't turn out very well. And there's a kind of a negative tip, and there's a positive tip, and I'm very much just I'm pretty much in the positive, and you, have you, been for quite some time. You have to have the bad stuff to bring out the good stuff. I think to you know the, the yin and yang and all that. I I think I'm a great believer in that. I really am. Yeah. I don't think anything, you know, apart from people, you know, losing people. I mean, that's that doesn't get much worse, you know, the, the bad stuff. And yet, as I say, you know, the, the trauma that happened in childhood really set me off on a tangential, you know, a different course to everybody in my class, maybe, you know, I went somewhere else. But, you know, the stuff of like, uh, you know, um, the, the the drink and the drugs and the the and the, oh the long travel time oh it's really hard you know and sitting around waiting all these years I mean it doesn't get much better somehow and yet you can overdo it it can take over it can ruin lives but if you come through it um, and I don't say you come through through skill it's probably a lot of luck as well but I count that as the luck I had when I you know first landed the first gig really it could have been anybody you know yeah but once you get given the space to 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 try something it kind of feeds the next thing and then if you stick at it and i don't mean diligently rehearsing and sticking at it it, it means being open mm. to the next thing really i think that's i had a philosophy and it still serves me well mm. as i said to you you know at the beginning that the with the podcast with Lola myself, um, our, our maxim is whatever happens comes our way is probably better than our best thinking. You yeah, know? yeah, absolutely, and and that's happened a lot with with um, with my podcast. Uh, I'll have a drummer on and he'll say, "Oh, have you spoken to such and such?" And I said, "Oh no, I didn't even think I can get them for you." And now this has happened, obviously, and and it leads us nicely to saying uh, uh, many thanks to our, our good friend Steve Grantley for for connecting us two up you know so that's the way it works i know organic yeah. is the word <laughs> i i met steve through that playing drums with stiff little thing as he was here in, in liverpool here in berlin <laughs> freudian slip i'm suddenly back in liverpool <laughs> um mixing the sound mixing sound was a gentleman by the name of tony sellinger who was the front of house sound for susie and the banshees when i joined right Okay. And uh, so, full circle. Uh, uh, Jake, I think we might have crossed paths over the years, but it was like me stepping back in time watching Stiff Little Fingers. I last saw them probably at Hammersmith Palais. Wow. Um, oh, it's all go. It's all oh. go. I, 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 it's funny because I've never been busier than I, I have been in this last in this period in Berlin. Mm. Um, I hooked up with the college, um, which is a British college. Yeah. Uh, the, the BIM. And uh, they opened their first college here seven years ago. Oh, right, okay. Oh, that was that was one of the first people in there with the the soon to be principal of this new college. And there was really no facility. Uh, we were like in noisy noisy rehearsal rooms, mm. running lessons. And uh, my only qualification was this, you know, was being in bands. But isn't that um, but isn't that the ultimate qualification? You know, you've done it and made a, a success of it, a, you know, successful successful career for however many years. Isn't that the ultimate? Um, 
I'd hope it is because mm. that's what I have, you know. Um, I I said, well, you know, I, I didn't complete my degree course at the Art College in Liverpool. I went on the road. Uh, I'd love to start in September, but I've got a gig with John Grant. You know, that just come up around 2016, 15, somewhere around there. And um, the vice principal came over from London, from Brighton, and she said, uh, well, go out on the, on the road, go out on the tour and come back and tell the students. I said, well, that's like an easy gig. Okay, I can do that. And then, you know, then, then the realization that this is like an academic course and you've got to hit certain markers. Um, but really, it, it, I, I feel... I, re- I remember going, I'd go back to my um, memory of my time at Liverpool uh, on the fine art course there. And I was so young and so green and, and, and really didn't know anything about writing essays or anything. I knew what I could, I could draw and I could paint. Um, and, and I was interested in the arts, but I didn't know how to be at college. <laughs> and I realized that if I could do anything to mentor these young people would be to encourage them to be themselves, you know, and, and just um, get down to the, the serious study when it's required mm-hmm. and, and what that means, because nobody told me that, uh, but also try anything, you know, really try, because you never know what it might be. You know? yeah. Well, I would rather hear that from somebody like yourself who's lived it and done it and got the T-shirt than a teacher who's who, who may be an incredible musician, but has never done anything Apart from that, I'd rather hear it from from somebody like yourself personally. I, I think there's a lot of. Lot I'm of with you, there. Matty. Yeah. I, I'm, thank you for that. Because <laughs> that's what they want to yeah. do, essentially, isn't it? That's what they want to be. You, of course. In another guise, you know. Um, well, I could, I could think of other people that could probably. Want you know. To <laughs> well, look, Budgie, you have been an absolute gentleman, and I honestly, I, I've thoroughly enjoyed it. I can't thank you enough for for giving up your Monday morning. Um, it's it's been a pleasure. Thank you to Steve as well for for introducing us. It's very kind of him. He's a good guy. Yes, thanks, Steve. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's um, I'm, I'm as I say, I'm doing another one this evening. So I'm doing my first two podcasts as a guest in the same day. It's bizarre. Isn't um, it? So you've had your dress rehearsal now. <laughs> I've done my rehearsal. Uh, yeah, um, but it's a pleasure, um, and it's, it's, you've got such a, a relaxed way about it as well. It's no no surprise to me that you've had some amazing people on here. Uh, I'm just glad to be part of the uh, the building crowd. Well, hey, I'm I'm glad to have you. So it's uh, you know it's, it's very kind of you, and it's appreciated. So hopefully, uh, you never know, we may run into each other at some point. Who knows, eh? Well, I'm hoping I'll get to to uh, over to Liverpool. Oh, wow. and the region sometime okay. soon and uh there's always a, a a slim chance but i always love those north wales uh names you know the ones you can't pronounce if you come to, uh, outside of wales yeah i did know and stuff you know and there's always a sea and i won't even att- <laughs> <laughs> yes oh, okay lovely stuff thank you ever so much budgie enjoy the rest of the day hope the snow doesn't get too bad and um as i say have a great podcast tonight as well Yes. Thanks, Matty. Thanks so much. See you now. Bye-bye. See you. Bye. Bye.